That's all. Continue, please. Yeah, the stage is yours, Akil. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So I had a different opening plan for this, but I think for all time's sake, I have to go with... <clears throat> Hello, podcastlers, and welcome to another episode of, of me talking. Uh, thank you for coming today. Today I am talking about crafting a prehistoric narrative, storytelling in Psycom, with particular reference to my short novel, Banjo and Swift, uh, published in 2021 with art by uh, Johan Vezenkov, or Yo-Yo, as you might know him. For those who don't know me, uh, I'm Yakovos, but my online username, Raptor, might precede me. I work primarily in the film industry, and for the past four years of my life, all my PowerPoints have been film pitches or board meetings. So that's under five minute presentations in which I try to sell you something. So bear with me as I try to not do that. On that note, please buy my book. If you haven't already, that sounds like a you problem because I will be going into spoilers in this talk. A brief overview. Um, the book is about the Winton Formation, with a specific focus on Australovenator, particularly two individuals, Banjo and Swift, um, Swift being the only individual to actually be present throughout the book. The narrative is split up across three parts, and there are two intermissions, which I term the sort of signs segments, in a When Dinosaurs Roamed America style way of inserting sort of some form of scientific information that is linked solely to our knowledge of the present, because obviously the rest of the book is actually set in the past, and I don't want to disrupt that too much. And a bit of backstory for context. Uh, the idea for this came about in early 2019, when I discovered that due to personal situation, I would have, I found myself with absolutely nothing to do over the month of March. I was like, you know what? I like writing. Let me give this a proper shot. And so I did brainstorming, came up with ideas, and eventually settled on this. And um, yeah, here we are now. 2021, it was published as paperback and ebook on Kindle uh, through Amazon. And a brief overview of what I will discuss. Firstly, I'm going to go through the narrative since that is sort of the key uh, aspect of this talk. Um, what it is, but more importantly, what it isn't. And with that last point, we will segue into the question of why bring narrative into scientific communication where we expand to contextual references. And speaking of contextual references, I want to begin with the sort of broadest concept that you can when creating a story. Um, and in fact, arguably the broadest context you can get to also just in, in an art form, which is emotion. So approaching this from the background of someone classically trained in film, what emotion you want to sort of invoke in the audience is, is crucial. Um, and approaching that question is easy to do if you start going multidisciplinary. And I want to bring up this book because it has a, it's, it's by philosopher, uh, philosopher Stefan Snivar. And I want to bring up one particular point, which was quite formative to me when I encountered it and influences a lot of how I view storytelling. I don't need you to agree with it or sympathize with it, although that would be nice. But I think it would be good for you to understand how I approach storytelling because it will be relevant. Um, and this is in connection to emotion. So concerning himself with emotion, uh, Sneva, with references to other philosophers' work as well, makes an argument that all emotions are, are changes in state. Happiness, sadness, anger, all core emotions derive from one state being disturbed and changing into another, often through external influence. Therefore, he proposes that since emotions are responses to consequential action, and therefore have a beginning, middle, and an end, all emotions are narratives. All emotions are just micro-narratives, either as a response to a causal narrative or interpreted as narratives themselves. He proposes you cannot remove emotions from narratives. You cannot tell a narrative without creating an emotion um, just inevitably. And you need a narrative to create emotion. You can't just provoke emotion uh, in someone. And so although I will refer to narrative primarily in this presentation, please bear in mind that I will always mean it synonymously with both the goal and the given that it is creating emotion. Sneva also goes on to suggest that since narratives are made of smaller narratives, narratives are therefore made of emotions. So narratives are made of emotions made of narratives, which is wild, but that is well beyond the themes of what we're discussing here. So pairing it back to the book, um, a brief overview for those who either haven't read it in a while or haven't read it. Uh, the book opens with Benjamin Swift, two brothers, best of charms, then Banjo finds a mate uh, after a 
brief competition with Swift, and Swift is exiled from their formerly shared territory. And then we go into part two, where Swift learns to survive on the shores of the Eremanga Seaway, which is receding at this time, and it's where he finds himself. And then after successfully doing so, he finds a mate in part three. But then Banjo turns up with his family, forced out by a drought, and out for more. And that brings us into our sort of climactic confrontation, where all the, the main core plot is, is wrapped up. And one of the things I like doing with narratives is breaking narratives down as sort of charts of relationships and causality. I never do this when writing. Uh, when writing and developing treatments, I only ever do it as bullet points or as paragraphs and in a sort of linear form. But retrospectively, I find it's quite useful to break down stories. And I thought it would be nice to break down my own work since I've experienced the before and after. So the core conflict is between Swift and then Banjo. And of course, Banjo's mate, uh, they become mates in part one. Uh, who I termed sort of Lady Macbeth, never named as such in the novel, but she is heavily inspired by the character, particularly interesting enough, that character's adaptation in Akira Kurosawa's Throne of Blood, which I consider the superior Macbeth adaptation. And then in part two, we just have Swift on his own, and then part three, we introduce our other sort of core character, which is, the, uh, which is Swift's mate. Full disclosure here, Looking back, the female characters in the story are the first thing I would change. I'm really not happy with them. I'm not happy with how I wrote them and would do so very differently, both because I think it's unfair to them and because I think the narrative as a whole, looking back, is much weaker for it, as is always the case, I believe, when you start neglecting to pay attention to certain characters because of stereotypes or internalized prejudices. So this is the first thing I would change, full disclosure, not happy with this. But it is what it is, and this is the sort of core narrative. And it's an entirely intraspecific one, composed of trinities. Part one is Banjo Swift and Lady Macbeth. And then it flips back and forth between that trinity and between Swift, Banjo, and Swift's mate in the third act. There was an intentional choice to never have a confrontation involving all four, because I just really like the simple dynamism of the three-body problem that trinities carry. And as this is going on, the this is the sort of the minor story or the a plot you have this much larger major story going on around it with the side characters the supporting cast and the world and his characters are why i chose to set the story in the winter in the first place not australia venator when it came to discussing and trying to decide what taxa to feature um when developing this it actually came down to either australia venator or imperobata which was at the time just the nays dromaeosaur as it was published actually a few months later so just as i started writing uh, and Australia Venter won out because of its formation, offering up this cast of characters. Because not only are they unique, they inherently inhabit unique niches that allow for the B-plot to be a lot more interspecific and play out more naturally based on these relationships. It's, whereas the A-plot is a more character-driven one, this is a more almost social commentary, if you were to liken it to a, a modern, you know, modern set piece. Um, and this B-plot occasionally filters into the A-plot, but importantly never becomes a part of it. This is the B-plot, which some of you might recognize as a classic template in literature, film, and particularly modern television. Sometimes the plots meet, but more often than not, they remain tangential to each other, or one frames the other by virtue of being a less high-stakes, more broad conflict or set of relationships. And then acting at the highest level of the B-plot is the environment itself, which is the constant setting, and the seasons, which are a dynamic setting. Together, these are characterless means of raising the stakes, which influence the plot. But let's take the A plot for a moment and break it down in another format to see if that illuminates anything new. Uh, specifically, the format I want to break it down into is the, the sort of the mythic hero's journey. Or normally the hero's journey has about 12 beats to it, but I've narrowed it down to seven because 12 is just way too much. So your ordinary world is Banjo and Swift's relationship. And then your call to adventures when Swift, obviously our protagonist, he's in the book for most of it. Uh, Swift is exiled, he crosses the first threshold with the Savannasaurus hunt, they approach the inmost cave, which is the point of highest tension, is when he encounters the Chronosaurus multiple times, and then the reward is when he gets into a new relationship. And then the road back, Banjo returns and we're setting up the climax, and the master of two worlds is when Swift wins and is victorious. Except Swift doesn't win. Swift loses to Banjo in their final confrontation, like he loses at every point they have a confrontation. Banjo just also loses. Swift doesn't win, and that's because Swift isn't the protagonist of the book. It's Banjo. Banjo is the protagonist of the book. And let's try this again. And this is important. I am going somewhere with this. Ordinary World, Banjo and Swift's relationship. Call to Adventure, Banjo exiles Swift. Crossing the first threshold, Banjo has a child. Terrible idea. Approach the inmost cave, drought. 
reward. Banjo defeats Swift, the road back. A wild Ferrodraco appears, and the master of two worlds, Banjo loses everything and is master of none. Because it's a tragedy, and I really wanted to tell a tragedy. This is Banjo's tragedy. That's what the story is, because the core theme of the novel, the core point, is the nature of greed. He gambles everything and loses, while Swift only fights for what he has. That is the theme of the story. It's just told through Swift's eyes. Because you've got to break it gently to the kids. You can't have a sad ending in, in Paleo Psychom, uh, which is something I will get back to at the end. So having outlined sort of that story with your in, in, very intraspecific, self-contained main plot, how much of the story is based on scientific fact? Well, not that much. There is the framing story, and there's a lot primarily in the form of the environment and the world, the preserved setting in the environment, because, you know, we have actually we know what the environment is so we actually have the setting where we can play this out and we have narratives preserved in the form of the seasons we actually know these year-long seasonal cycles and we also have narratives in the form of the recession of the Eramanga seaway the animals are based in science but only by virtue of you know being animals that we know of with plausible interspecific relationships that could lead to you know halfway decent storylines i'm a particular fan of the old anhangwarian whose last flight forms a literal backdrop for the ape plot. I think that's a quite nice cutaway. That's one of the parts I'm happiest with. But there's also stuff here that I got really lucky with, like, speaking of which, the Anhangwarians, which were just written as random Anhangwarians, and halfway through writing, Ferrojaku gets described, which is very convenient. I just I just made them up. Um, all I need now is those speculative Yun and Lagines to turn up, and I can sleep easy at night. And there are creative liberties. People point out Chronosaurus does not live at the same time frame. We don't have preserved chronosaurus from the same time frame as when the story said. It precedes it a bit. But, you know, you have to choose that as an intertextual reference to Raptor Red. Because if you don't include chronosaurus in a mid-Cretaceous Australia story, that's it. I will never get this chance again. And obviously Raptor Red is sort of the original in terms of, of this kind of paleofiction. Like, paleofiction with science or science with a bit of paleonarrative. But none of the main story has anything to do with science. It's not connected to any of the framing. The framing connects to it, but it is not influenced by the framing. It's entirely intraspecific, based on you know, interactions that are functionally made up. There's a few small bits there, like the you know some plausible means of combat, uh, intraspecific nature, uh, based on excellent animals, but it's made up. It's, it's a, it's, the story's a tragedy. It's, it's Loosely, it's a coming-of-age story. It's a love story, if you're really pushing it. But it has fuck all to do with Australovenator. You could transpose this story to any other animal and it would work. It is, in fact, pure fiction, a total fabrication. So yes. why do that? Why, looking back, why, what's the point of bringing storytelling into your psychom if the storytelling is not inherently based in the psychom? What does that benefit? Does that benefit the psychom? Is it benefiting from the psychom? Is there any point to that? Well, I ask you, what's the most memorable story in paleo -psychom. What's the one everyone in the paleo community will recognize and resonate with, if not mention it outright when asked? It's this fucking thing. Everyone remembers this fucking guy. Nine times out of ten, that's what anyone will say. They remember him because of that emotional connection. And when I say emotional connection, I mean, of course, narrative. The narrative journey it takes. Yes, there's sad music and pretty pictures, but if it didn't have that narrative, in the large scale of it, but also the small things along the way, the little trials and tribulations, his journey is a classic hero's journey that just ends in tragedy. But it's not just him. This, this trend extends beyond dinosaurs. Extant psychom and nature documentaries do turn to narrative, and interestingly enough, whenever they do so, it is usually to popular acclaim. Probably one of the best examples, and one of that we can quantify as being one of the most successful instances of narrative storytelling in nature documentaries is Dynasties. Eight million viewers on one episode, making it one of the most watched BBC nature documentaries of the past five years, narrowly behind Seven Worlds, One Planet, which also has a narrative, each episode following the regional interactions between humanity and nature, the two more abstract characters in your 2001 A Space Odyssey style way of, of more grandiose storytelling. In four years since its original series release, Dynasties has already had a sequel series and two Christmas specials, which is nuts when you think about it, because that is the fastest turnaround on a BBC nature documentary in the past decade. And it works the other way too. Science can support narratives because you can use it as a source for narratives, by which I mean micro-narratives as well as macro, larger scale narratives, like the overall plot. Everyone knows Jurassic Park with the spark that has arguably dwindled a little, though that is also in terms of pure narrative. But you have modern examples too, like Cocaine Bear, 
quick interruption. Putting these side by side for the presentation, my mind is blown by the fact that these are both universal but 30 years apart. That disturbs me deeply. Now, Cocaine Bear is interesting because it, really enough, ends up acting like an actual bear. Again, spoiler warning, mute yourselves if you want to watch Cocaine Bear for the plot. It, 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 it starts out as a just general serial killer antagonist, but then slowly becomes an actual bear, which is a really interesting choice and one that I don't think works very well. I've heard complaints about the plot, and I've heard complaints about the plot directly linked to how it changes over the course of the film. Logically, you'd expect it to be the other way around, with it becoming more serial killer and unhinged as it goes along. But regardless of how that has affected the macro narrative, there are still such the brilliant moments of comedy and levity and even moments of emotion. Like there's, you introduce cubs and it becomes an actual sort of, it becomes a character you can understand and weirdly become empathetic. And if this were an industry pitch, stuff like this would be the focus of my talk, science influencing narrative, but that's not what we are. So let's go, circle back to actual cycle. The prehistoric planet, and I'm a very scared, because I do want to point out that prehistoric planet doesn't do any of this in the slightest. It is a loosely connected, often slapped together assortment of, to be honest, random random stuff. That is is, you know, some episodes try and tie it together, but we all know forests was just made up last minute in terms of its structure, and the episodes themselves are very just snapshot in time which is fine that's what it's trying to do it's trying to be the sort of documentary it just lacks any narrative weight except for one segment and i'm concluding with this segment in terms of my context because i think it's very similar and i i hope some of you are starting to suspect what it is but it's brilliance <laughs> it's one of the most iconic and loved segments in the show and absolutely none of it has to do with science None of what happens here has to do with Carnotaurus or the science on display. None of the animals that live with, none of the world, none of that actually shows up. It's just it's the narrative of a protagonist attempting attempting and failing miserably at seduction, which is a story that we all relate to and can be told with any taxon. Even the Bowerbird stuff is actually transposed from other taxa. But it's easily one of the most memorable and liked segments in the show because of that narrative hook. And so if 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 you're trying to get someone to notice the little things and remember the little things, wouldn't you want them to remember your segment as well? And that's what it is. In all these cases, it is a framing device. Even dynasties, you could, even though these stories are filmed and then still obviously heavily edited, color graded, and hugely manipulated with sound design and the post to end just construction of narrative. If you were to even go one step further and, and entering the realm of paleocycom where you can actually just you are literally just making up stories you can just tell these stories in any any group of animals and you'll end up with a memorable story and people will by association start remembering the animals ornithochirus has the the whole concept of intercontinental pterosaurs i swear to god it's all because of this guy because we care about him and this is especially pertinent if you want to bring in people who would not be interested in the first place. You need this framing device, and you need one that doesn't rely, therefore, on science and the scientific interest. And I know some people say SCICOM doesn't have to also be outreach, which is a valid point, but I disagree that it shouldn't be, because why not both? You can have both, and if you could have both, I'm not saying we always need to have both, but if you could have both, because then you're just slowly getting into an echo chamber. So we can see it's very successful in the mainstream as well in terms of critical reception in the case of Dynasty's investor backing and and outreach. You know, these have won Emmys shows here. And it's also good for getting people to listen and remember scientific information through proximity. But so bring it back full circle. Do I think it's worked for me based on personal experiences? Because I can relate secondhand research and all that all the time. But personal experience, do I think it's worked for me? Yes. Because my target with this was to get Psycom to people who wouldn't seek it out and to get narrative to people in Psycom who might have forgotten about that along the way. And I think it has worked, and interestingly enough, particularly the former. I've had very positive reviews and feedback online and in person from people who would not otherwise engage with dinosaur media. And going back to that thing about, you know, what perspective you tell from, this includes people of all ages. This includes children who have resonated with it and picked up both the science and the themes that I was trying to get across. And because I'm running out of time here, I'm going to conclude with the most important point of why I think this has worked and made this book really sort of resonate 
And it's the fact that it has been plagiarized four times, as I discovered in preparation for this talk. And you know you've made it when you've been plagiarized not once, but four times. Thank you all for listening. Loud clapping noises. Thank you very much, Akio. Uh, beautiful talk. We have, I think, like... We do. We have yeah. a couple questions. Um, we have a little bit of type of questions. Quick here. Oh god. Right, yeah. let me open up Twitch because yeah. I didn't want an echo. But yeah, I think um I think uh given given the time frame, let's let's open up right away with some questions here. Uh -huh. uh, Space Muppet asks, at what point does a central conflict transition from man versus man to man versus nature in the story, oriented around naturalistic animals? What's really the difference between these two conflict styles? I mean, I would argue what's really interesting is you don't have a dichotomy of man versus nature at all. But, like, it, it does get very interesting because you've got, you know, nature versus other nature. But yeah. it does depend on how you play it. And what's really interesting is you can get, you can actually start grouping nature into smaller groups. Because, like, with the show, like, with the, the book, for instance, you've got nature versus drought. You get much, you get non-animal nature which you can explore on an even deeper level than most man versus nature stories will go because you, you, you're you creating multiple layers to it because you, you can have man versus man in terms of in, intraspecific, man versus nature in terms of interspecific. That's where I would often draw the line. I don't think it works across species to do man versus man, but it could. It could. And then you have, you know, nature versus the sort of the wider world. And you're you're forced to face all of these because these are often characters that don't have a concept of the distinctions, but are forced to deal with them on a daily basis. So I think that there's a lot more complexity when you're doing it with non-human characters. Yeah, I can see because that. Because you're right. you're, cha you're challenging the sort of the preconceptions. I yeah. think we have time for one more question here. Yep. Uh, well, maybe two, actually. Uh, one, I think this one might be a little easier for, for you to answer quickly, but yeah. is Banjo intended to be THE Banjo from the fossil? Record? Hey! As that's in, the first time I've gotten that question. Backstory. That's the first time. I deliberately left it open. I don't think there was ever a draft of this book where Banjo dies. There were multiple drafts where other characters die, and Ferrodraco was not even originally supposed to turn up in the end. Um, but... Yeah, um, I deliberately wanted to leave it open. I don't know. I don't know. I don't. It, it's also very contingent on whether or not the banjo specimen turns out to be immature. Because if it is, that kind of fucks it. True. <laughs> That's one of the reasons I didn't yeah. want to commit. Because I do have the suspicion until we do histology. Because we do have a larger megaraptor cell from the formation slightly. But I know, like paleontologists, I think I want to say Novas has suggested that perhaps the different re remains we see are actually different ontogenetic stages. Right. With, yeah. And uh, Petit has asked, um, "What would you do to change forests?" And that might get a little complicated. So I'm also going to make the <laughs> announcement that um, if you have any questions, um, and uh, Akira, assuming you you'd like to answer them, yeah. Uh, in questions and answers, we have the thread for this specific talk. We will be posting the next thread now. So if you do have any questions. For Caro, please go into that thread and uh, start up a, con a conversation. Indeed. Thank you again for presenting.